Welcome to Friends Seminary and to our annual Visiting Scholars Public Lecture. It is our pleasure to see so many with Friends Seminary ties here, and it is especially gratifying to welcome to our campus so many who have never visited us before. When this program was being created several years ago, it was important to me and to the donor that there be a public component that would allow Friends Seminary to share these special moments with neighbors, friends, and the general public. And we are glad that you join us tonight in this historic 15th Street Meeting House, where the likes of John Lennon, the civil rights era activist Bayard Rustin, actor Ethan Hawke, Arun Gandhi, and artist James Turrell, among many others, others have spoken or performed. Tonight, Jeffrey Tubin joins this list, and I am thrilled that he has accepted the offer to be our 2012-2013 visiting scholar. Beginning on Monday, Jeff will start a residency at Friends where he will teach and work with students in fourth grade who are now getting their first formal exposure to the Constitution and to the electoral process. He'll be working with seventh and eighth graders who are studying the place of the U.S. within a global context. And he'll also be working with more advanced students in the upper school who are studying American history. He will also be a very welcome guest in our senior law elective which is currently studying previous and current Supreme Court cases focusing on civil rights. Jeff doesn't require much of an introduction. His work as a legal correspondent at CNN and his insightful writings for The New Yorker have made him a household name and face. Most recently, his books on the Supreme Court, First, The Nine, and Just This Fall, The Oath, have captured the attention of a country increasingly focused, and for very good reason, on the Supreme Court. Jeff's topic tonight is timely, as President Obama begins a new term that will surely yield at least one new appointee, if not more, to the court. And certainly, his topic has special resonance for this Quaker community, which for hundreds of years has been dedicated to justice, equality, and respect for all peoples. Please join me in welcoming our scholar for this year, Jeffrey Tubin. Hello, everyone. What a beautiful setting. What a wonderful introduction. I'm so pleased to be here. Um, unfortunately, um, my, uh, I, I, you know, I've never been here before. I, I went to Columbia Prep. Uh, Mr. Blank, my former history teacher, is here. Oh, there he is. I'm <laughs> delighted to see him. He's been here, I know, quite a long time. But he was one of my teachers at Columbia Prep. Um, and my kids went to Ethical Culture and then Fields. And so most of my uh, dealings with uh, friends have been on the athletic field. Um, <laughs> and uh, I have to say, um, it's not the greatest <laughs> legacy of either school, any of the schools I'm affiliated with. But uh, I do remember a very painful, my son was a soccer player at Fieldston, and uh, you had a particularly great soccer player a couple of years ago who went to Oberlin. Um, I'm trying to remember his name. Somebody here, Mary. Is that? Oliver. Oliver. Oliver, and he scored a last minute goal against Fieldston that broke our hearts. <laughs> it was quite an impressive thing. And, and, and Oliver, who's also a through another way. He, uh, and I know he's a big star at Oberlin now, so I wish he played for Fields. So, uh, anyway, so hello everyone. I'm delighted to talk to you. Um, you know, I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes and then looking forward to taking your questions. And if I can start by anticipating a question that you may have, which is, who's your favorite justice? Now, this is a question that I struggle with because my favorite justice for so many years was David Souter because David Souter was just so weird. Um, David Souter, here's a guy who didn't um, have a computer, who didn't use a cell phone, who didn't like electric light. Uh, it's true. He moves his chair around his office over the course of the day to catch the sunlight through the window. He eats the same lunch. Every, every day he has a cup of yogurt and an apple, including the core. Uh, it's true. But, but the great thing about Justice Souter, in addition to his really wonderful jurisprudence, 
is he had a great perspective on what it meant to be a Supreme Court justice because he recognized that the justices were at once very important public people, but as private figures, they were largely unknown to the public. And um, he, he recognized the, the, the sort of irony and amusement um, in, in that fact. Um, for example, for reasons that remain obscure, David Souter and Stephen Breyer are frequently mistaken for each other. Now, if you know what they look like, they really don't look at all alike, but, but it happens to both of them fairly often. And, and, and one time, not too long ago, Justice Souter, as he often did, um, was uh, driving from Washington to his home in New Hampshire, and he stopped at a little restaurant to get something to eat. And he's sitting there, and a couple comes up to him, and the guy says, I know you, you're on the Supreme Court, right? He says, yes. Yeah. He says, you're Stephen Breyer, right? And Souter didn't want to embarrass the fellow in front of his wife, so he said, yes, I'm Stephen Breyer. <laughs> and they chatted for a little while, but then there was a question that Souter wasn't ready for. So the guy said, so Justice Breyer, what's the best thing about being on the Supreme Court? He thought for a minute and he said, I have to say it's the privilege of serving with David Sue. <laughs> How can you not love this guy, right? But he's gone and I need a new favor. Okay, well let's talk about the Supreme Court by the numbers. Um, there are six men and three women. First time in history um, there have been three women on the Supreme Court. There are six Catholics and three Jews. There are no Protestants the Supreme Court for the first time in history. Bo, have there ever been, I'm sure I should have researched this before I came here, have there ever been any Quaker justices? I know you're big in presidents. The Nixon Hoover legacy probably doesn't get discussed <laughs> a lot here right now. But, but I, I don't think, not that I know of. Um, although it, it does come up in, um, in my book, I mean just note parenthetically, you know my book is called The Oath and it begins with the botched oath, um, and um, the um, the Constitution, you know, the, the oath is spelled out in the Constitution, and it, it says, "I solemnly swear (parentheses or affirm," and the reason "affirm" was put in there is at least I forgive my ignorant contemporary ignorance. Um, at least in the 18th century, Quakers did not swear, and and so it was put in there. Um, in case there were any Quaker presidents, and there has been one president who chose to affirm his oath rather than um, um, swear to it, and it was not either of the two Quakers, it was Franklin Pierce. Talk about a big thud, huh? I mean, like, <laughs> that's the only time I ever saw any reference to Franklin Pierce, to tell you the truth, but there it is. He, he affirmed his oath. But where were we? So, okay, so six Catholics, three Jews, some mysterious number of Quakers, perhaps, in, his, in the history of the court. Um, there are representatives of four New York City boroughs on the Supreme Court. Sonia Sotomayor is from the Bronx, Antonin Scalia is from Queens, Ruth Ginsburg is from Brooklyn, Elena Kagan is from Manhattan. Tragically, Staten Island is unrepresented on the Supreme Court, but perhaps future appointments will address that uh, absence. Um, but anyway, so those are some no numerical facts about the Supreme Court, which I hope you found interesting. But they are only interesting. Here's an important fact about the Supreme Court. There are five Republicans and four Democrats. Now, I'm going to talk for a little while longer, but you now know most of what you need to know about the contemporary <laughs> Supreme Court. There are five Republicans and four Democrats. It's often thought, it's often hoped, it's often even believed sometimes that um, the Supreme Court is a refuge from the partisan uh, divisions in this country. You know, they're just across First Street from the U.S. Capitol. They can all look out their windows and see the Capitol. And, and they like to think of themselves, oh, we're so different, we're not like them. And, you know, it's one reason why judges wear robes, is it's meant they're, it's, they all look alike, and then, you know, justice is, justice, you know, it doesn't matter who the judge is. Well, I'm here to tell you it matters a lot uh, which party there are, they're from. Five Republicans and four Democrats. And um, the court has been evenly divided uh, in this way for a very long time. Um, and um, to see why this moment is so important in the history of the court, I think you need to go back. Back to the last time the court was not evenly divided. The last time the court was really a unified ideological force and that's the mid and late 1960s when there were seven liberals 
on the Supreme Court. So the late tenure of Ju Chief Justice Earl Warren, it's very, you know, th there was a, there were seven liberals and there was a real liberal agenda. You know, every Saturday morning, Ju Chief Justice Warren and his great deputy, William Brennan, they'd meet and they'd say, what are the cases we want to take? How are we going to move the ball forward? And, and year after year, there were these landmark cases that, that, that in 1964, New York Times against Sullivan, the case, Justice Brennan's opinion that uh, revolutionized libel law and, and gave the press important new protections. 1965, Justice William O. Douglas's opinion in um, Griswold versus Connecticut, the case that said um, there was a right to privacy in the Constitution, said that married couples could no longer be barred from buying birth control. 1965, uh, I'm sorry, 1966, Chief Justice Warren's opinion in Miranda versus Arizona, revolutionizing criminal procedure, but perhaps more importantly, changing television dramas. <laughs> <laughs> like the one, the one right everybody, oh, right to remain silent. Um, 1967, and I'd like to pause here for a moment on, on this case because I think it has a special resonance um, after the events of the last 10 days. 1967, perhaps the best named case in the history of the Supreme Court. What was this case? Loving versus Virginia. Loving, what was the case of Loving versus Virginia about? It was the case that said states could no longer ban racial intermarriage. I mean, think about that, 1967. There are people in this room who were alive in 1967, is that right? <laughs> See, uh, you know, not, none of those students, but Bo and I were. Mr. Blank and I wrote in 1967. <laughs> and uh, yet it wasn't until 1967 that um, the court decided this, this incredibly barbaric law, you know, law that is just not only unconstitutional today, but inconceivable today, um, which, um, you know, the, the court got around to saying uh, states could no longer do that anymore. Which brings me to the subject of same-sex marriage and the incredible results uh, in, the, in the referendum last week. You know, with all due respect to Barack Obama, who had a pretty good Tuesday, I think we can all agree. Um, historically, um, the, the, the votes on marriage equality may turn out to be equally significant to his re-election. Just for a little historical perspective. Before last week, same-sex marriage had been on the ballot in various states 33 times, some states several times, so 33 elections, and in all 33, marriage equality lost. Last Tuesday, marriage equality was on the ballot in four states, and it won in all four states. Think about that. Think about what a change that is in this society. Now, uh, in three of the states, Maryland, Maine, and Washington state, it was really a straight up vote on whether same-sex marriage should be allowed. So now, those three states join the six states in the District of Columbia. Um, the uh, Minnesota vote was about an attempt to ban same-sex marriage, and that was voted down. Uh, but it didn't, it didn't impose same-sex marriage. But, but think about how much this country has changed on this subject. You know, in 2004, um, Karl Rove, who was running President Bush's uh, re-election campaign in 2004, he engineered putting same-sex marriage on the ballot because he thought it would drive turnout to the Republicans. This time, Republicans were so embarrassed by their opposition to same-sex marriage that they barely mentioned it. You know, as, as I'm sure you all know, President uh, Obama uh, endorsed same-sex marriage uh, this spring, and the Republicans made no issue of it because the country is changing so fast on this issue. And, and um, you know, I, I know my friends who work, you know, in the struggle for marriage equality, they're often very frustrated and they're very... Um, you know, they think the progress isn't, isn't happening fast enough and I can hardly blame them. But if you look at the history of this country and civil rights struggles in this country, the progress on gay rights generally and marriage equality in particular is like lightning. 
it's like lightning. You know, now public opinion polls show more than half the people support marriage equality. It, it's just a stunning change in this country, and it was really illustrated uh, by the vote uh, in 1960, by, by the vote in those four states. Um, but anyway, so, so going back to sort of the Supreme Court in the 60s, um, you never know how Supreme Court vacancies are going to work. Um, Jimmy Carter is the only president in American history to serve a full term and not have the opportunity to name anyone to the Supreme Court. It just There were no vacancies uh, between 1977 and 1981. But Richard Nixon got four vacancies. Now, you'll recall Richard Nixon was only president for five and a half years. He had to leave early. Um, it, was a, it was a whole anti-Quaker thing, frankly. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, the, um, but four justices left on, on Nixon's watch. And who were they? Um, Chief Justice Warren, Abe Fortas, John Harlan, and Hugo Black. And Nixon got to name all of their replacements. And who did he name? Chief Justice Warren Burger, Lewis Powell, Harry Blackman, and William Rehnquist. And as you think about Richard Nixon's appointments to the Supreme Court, I think it illustrates something about the Supreme Court, but also something that is even bigger than the Supreme Court, and frankly, the biggest development in our lifetimes in American politics, and that's the evolution of the Republican Party. The Republican Party of Richard Nixon is unrecognizable from the Republican Party of today. And you saw that in Nixon's appointments to the Supreme Court. Nixon's appointments, for the most part, were moderates. Nixon was a moderate. He was a criminal, but he was also a moderate. And, um, the, um, and, and the Supreme Court, a lot of people thought, oh, um, you know, the court's going to move way to the, way to the right because Nixon has all these appointments. But it didn't. And in fact, the 70s at the Supreme Court were nearly as liberal as the 60s. They ended the death, uh, they, uh, they ended the death penalty in the whole country in 1972, though they let it back in in 1976. They approved school busing. They forced Nixon out of office in the Nixon tapes case. Um, and of course, still the most controversial decision of them all, Roe versus Wade, 1973, was the case that said states could no longer ban abortion. That was a seven to two opinion. The only dissenters in Roe v. Wade were Byron White, who was appointed by President Kennedy, and uh, William Rehnquist. So three of the four Nixon justices were in the majority in Roe v. Wade. Inconceivable today for Republican appointees to the Supreme Court. Um, and it just tells you a lot. 1980, obviously things began to change. Ronald Reagan gets elected president. The next year, uh, he comes to Washington with someone who's a very underrated figure in recent American history, I think, and that's Edwin Meese. Probably not even a lot of you students in particular even know who he is. Edwin Meese was an aide to Ronald Reagan. He was briefly um, the attorney general, and he was the person who said, look, there has been a liberal agenda at the Supreme Court for a long time. We need a conservative agenda. And so what was that agenda? Expand executive power and racial preferences intended to assist African Americans. Speed up executions. Um, and um, lower the barriers between church and state. And above all, reverse Roe versus Wade and allow states once again to ban abortion, a big part of the Reagan Revolution, as it's sometimes called, was the arrival in Washington of a group of young, brilliant, conservative lawyers. And who were two of the best and the brightest of that group? John Roberts and Samuel Alito. Tells you a lot about who they are and who they were. Um, but the Republican Party of Ronald Reagan was not the Republican Party of today either. And you saw that in Reagan's appointments to the Supreme Court. 1981, Potter Stewart unexpectedly announced his, his resignation from the court. And who replaced him? Well, Ronald Reagan had made a campaign promise that Jimmy Carter didn't even make. Reagan said, if I have the chance, I will appoint the first woman to the Supreme Court. And you know, it wasn't a simple thing in those days, especially for a Republican, because there weren't a lot of women in the traditional pipelines. Um, to the Supreme Court, circuit court judgeships and the like. So Reagan's people had to go all the way to the intermediate appeals court in Arizona, not even the highest court in Arizona, to find the remarkable figure who was and is Sandra Day O'Connor. And Justice O'Connor was a moderate. 
Everybody knew it. Everybody knew it then, and that was just fine with Ronald Reagan. Uh, because that was, in some respects, the kind of president he was. Um, 1986, uh, Chief Justice uh, Berger stepped down. Reagan elevated William Rehnquist from Associate Justice to Chief Justice, named Antonin Scalia to that seat. No question, conservative justice then, conservative justice now. 1987, a real key turning point in the history of the Supreme Court. Uh, 1987, Lewis Powell stepped down. And, you know, back then, um, just like now, the court was very evenly divided between liberals and conservatives, and um, the uh, so Powell's departure was very significant. So what did Ronald Reagan do? He nominated Robert Bork to that seat, and it was the biggest fight over the ideology of a Supreme Court justice that we'd ever seen. And something very important had happened between the confirmation of Scalia and Rehnquist in '86 and the nomination of Bork in 87. In the midterm elections of 1986, the Democrats had retaken control of the United States Senate. So the chairman of the Judiciary Committee was no longer uh, Strom Thurmond of South Carolina, but instead it was a young senator from Delaware named Joseph Biden. And Biden engineered hearings on, um, on, on Bork that really were an engagement with what Bork thought about the Constitution. And uh, he had said there was no such thing as a uh, right to privacy. He had said the Civil Rights Act was a monstrous invasion of personal rights. And the Supreme and the, and the Senate said, too conservative. And he was voted down 58 to 42. And instead, Ronald Reagan nominated Anthony Kennedy to that seat in 1987 who, while no liberal, is certainly much more uh, liberal than Bork would have been. And that really set the stage for uh, the Rehnquist years uh, on the court, which I wrote about in my last book, The Nine. And, and you know, when I started working on The Nine, um, I was inspired by uh, a book that may be familiar to some of you, it's a pretty old book by now, The Brethren by Bob Woodward and Scott Armstrong, which was sort of the first behind the scenes book about the Supreme Court. And the theme of that book was um, how all the justices, without regard to politics, couldn't stand Warren Burger. They thought he was a pompous <laughs> jerk. And, and, and if, you, if you look at the history of the court, that, those sort of contentious relations is really the rule more than the exception. In the 1950s, the court was known as nine scorpions in a bottle. Um, in, in the um, 1955, William O. Douglas, cantankerous liberal, um, had, had a terrible car accident in rural Washington State. He drove his car off a cliff. And the first question everybody asked back at the Supreme Court was, where was Felix Frankfurter at the time? Because they hated each other so much <laughs> that they thought that uh, Frankfurter might have tried to kill him. Well, you know, I started, I started you know, working on you know, my behind the scenes stuff on the Supreme Court and I thought, great, this is what I'll be able to do. I'll write about the infighting at the Rehnquist Court and how they all hated each other. Well. To my disappointment as a journalist, but somewhat to my satisfaction as a citizen, I learned that in fact the justices got along very well in the Rehnquist years. And in most in many respects, um, they got along well. They still get along uh, pretty well. One reason um, they get along very well under Rehnquist is Rehnquist engineered a tremendous reduction in the court's workload. In the 80s, the justices were deciding about 150 cases a year. Last year, they decided 68. Wow. You know, in the 80s, there was such a, um, ex you know, the, the caseload got so big, there was actually a serious proposal to add a sort of super appeals court between the circuit courts and, and the Supreme Court. And this proposal went to um, the White House <coughs> for evaluation, and the White House counsel at the time um, assigned a young lawyer on his staff, a fellow named John Roberts, to evaluate this proposal. And this is what young John Roberts wrote. While some of the tales of woe emanating from the court are enough to bring tears to the eyes, it is true that only Supreme Court justices and school children are expected to and do take the entire summer off. <laughs> the now Chief Justice does not talk this way anymore. <laughs> the entire summer off looks particularly good from where, where he's sitting, and um, the court remains a congenial place. And um, 
To, do, to see that, uh, you need only go to a Supreme Court in oral argument. Now, I'm sure in a group like this, perhaps some of you have been, but if I can simply just urge you, go see a Supreme Court argument. I'm serious. It is a totally fascinating experience. Um, it's also free. Uh, and, um, you know, I, maybe you have school trips to Washington. I, I mean, just go. It's, it's a very interesting experience. It's quite intimate. You can see that the, the justices in action. You get a real sense of their personalities. And there is, of course, one very well-known fact about Supreme Court oral arguments. And that is, there are eight justices who are very engaged and very well prepared and ask lots of hard questions, and Clarence Thomas never says anything. <laughs> February 22nd, 2006. That was the last time Clarence Thomas asked a question. You know, those of us who go to, frequently go to Supreme Court oral arguments, you, can, you can't help it, but you always sit there thinking, will this be the day? <laughs> Will this be the day he has to And it never is. But you know, you still think, will you, you wonder, will it be the day? But see, this is why you have to go in person, because you see that Justice Thomas is not silent. Um, he, they sit in seniority order, he sits between Breyer and Kennedy, they pass notes, they tell jokes, they, I mean, they, Thomas is not an unpopular or isolated or, or uninfluential justice, for better or worse. He is an influential justice, but just for his own bizarre reasons, he chooses not to ask uh, any questions. Now, um, and think about the Rehnquist Court. Um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's useful to think of the court, I think, in two parts, 1986 to 2000 and 2000 to 2005. And the dividing point uh, in the history of the court, and in many respects a dividing point in the history of our country, is the court's decision in, in Bush v. Gore. Now, um, I, I, I have to admit, even 12 years later, I, I, I'm kind of obsessed by, by Bush v. Gore. You know, um, my last book before the nine was a book called Too Close to Call. It was about the recount in Florida. And one of the things I tried to do when I was writing that book is I, I wanted to interview Al Gore, right? I mean, that would be a smart thing to do if you were writing that book. Well, I tried everything. I wrote, I called, I worked every connection I had. Gore didn't want to talk about it. He just wouldn't talk to me about it. So I wrote the book without him. Well, just by coincidence, while I was working on the nine, I met Al Gore at a social occasion. And... Um, he had read Too Close to Call, and we were talking, and, and I said to him, I said, Mr. Vice President, you're not going to believe this. I'm writing another book <laughs> where Bush v. Gore is at the center of it. I said, I think I must be the biggest Bush v. Gore junkie in the world. And he said to me, you may be second. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think you've got to give him a nod for. Um, you know, when, when Justice Scalia gives talks, as he often does, you know, he's an outgoing guy, you know, fearless, combative, um, he often gets a kind of hostile reaction, you know, hostile question about Bush v. Gore, and he always says the same thing. Oh, get over it. <laughs> well, I'm not over it, um, but uh, that's just me. Um, but the, the peculiar aspect of Bush v. Gore in terms of its legacy at the court was the court got more liberal from 2000 to 2005. Now, why would that be? As I believe you all know, in Bush v. Gore, Bush won, and uh, he was president, but then the court got more liberal. Because think about the big decisions, 2000 and 2005, they ended the death penalty for the mentally retarded, ended the death penalty um, for, the, uh, for juvenile offenders. They decided Lawrence v. Texas, the case that said gay people could no longer be thrown in prison for having consensual sex. They saved affirmative action in the University of Michigan law school case. And in case after case, they rejected the Bush administration's position on the war on terror in, in, in the Guantanamo Bay, the treatment of the detainees there. So why? Why did Bush lose all those cases? Well, remember who the swing vote was in that period. It was Justice O'Connor. And Justice O'Connor grew more and more alienated from the modern Republican Party. Uh, she didn't like John Ashcroft. She didn't like the war on terror. She didn't like the war with the the, uh, the uh, war in Iraq was going. And above all, she was alienated by something that doesn't get a lot of attention now, 
and, and you know, for the students here, I'm frankly, I'm not even sure if you know what it is, uh, but it's the Terry Schiavo case. Terry Schiavo case was a case in, in, in Florida where a desperately ill woman, she was in a persistent vegetative state, her ex-husband tried to get the machines cut off. And it became a huge cause celeb among conservatives in Washington. And, and, and basically the whole federal government stopped so that Congress could pass a law saying that case had to be reevaluated. And you know, O'Connor was, was so offended by this, in part because you know, she, she was you know, a moderate Republican and she saw you know, what was happening to her party, but there was a more personal dimension too. Because at precisely that time, 2003, 2004, Justice O'Connor's husband, John, was slipping into the grip of Alzheimer's disease. So the idea of medical decision making for a critically ill family member wasn't just an abstraction for her, it was something um, that had a great personal resonance. And in 2005, she left the court, even though she was in good health, only 75 years old, because she wanted to take care of her husband. Uh, and George W. Bush, had the opportunity in short order, in just a couple of months, to make two appointments to the court, and he made appointments to the court that were consistent with the modern Republican Party. John Roberts and Samuel Alito are considerably more conservative than the Republican justices they replaced, William Rehnquist and Sandra Day O'Connor, and the court is now a more conservative place, and you see that in decision after decision. You see it in their decision to strike down the gun control laws in Chicago and in the District of Columbia. Uh, you see it in their decisions to strike down the school integration plans in Seattle and um, Louisville. You see it above all in um, the signature decision of the Roberts Court so far, Citizens United. Uh, about uh, whether campaigns uh, can be regulated and who can give money uh, and how much. And Stephen Breyer, who is not a uh, hysteric by any means, said uh, after one of these decisions, it is not often in law that so few have quickly undone so much. And, um, but, but justices really tell you most where they stand by how they vote with their feet and when they leave. Um, and all you really need to know about David Souter and John Paul Stevens, both Republican appointees to the Supreme Court, is when they decided to leave. They decided to leave when Barack Obama was president. And think about the last three justices to leave, Justice O'Connor, Justice Souter, Justice Stevens. Three more different human beings you will never encounter. Justice O'Connor, this tall, charismatic, outgoing, former politician from Arizona. David Souter, the shy, reclusive bachelor from New Hampshire. John Paul Stevens, this wily antitrust lawyer from Chicago. Really nothing in common in terms of personality, but all Republicans and all left the court completely alienated from the modern Republican Party and Souter and, and Stevens gave their seats to Barack Obama, who filled them with moderate Democrats just like him, Sonia Sotomayor and, and Elena Kagan. And all of that set the stage for the drama at the end of last term, the health care case. Now, one of the problems with working for CNN, as I do, is they keep the tapes of the stuff you say on TV. <laughs> so I can't come to you and say, I predicted it all along. I knew that you know, Chief Justice Roberts would join with the, the Democrats to uphold the law. It surprised the hell out of me. I was just completely flabbergasted. I, I, I was at the arguments, I was in the courtroom when it was decided, and no one was more astonished uh, than I was because here you have Chief Justice Roberts, you know, totally you know, conservative record in his first six years on the bench. For the first and only time in his tenure, siding with the four Democrats in a five to four decision. Why? Why did he do it? Well, I think you have to, at one level, just take what he wrote at face value that he thought 
you know, the, the controversy at the heart of the case, or so it appeared, was whether the Commerce Clause of Article I of the Constitution authorized Congress to impose the individual mandate, the requirement that everybody buy health insurance. And almost all the argument was about that, and the four conservatives who talked at oral argument were obviously very skeptical of that idea, and many people, myself included, thought that meant they were ready to strike down the law. Well, the five of them did vote to say that the Commerce Clause uh, did not justify uh, striking down the law. But um, Roberts reached for a subsidiary argument, an argument that got very little attention in the arg in, in, you know, when the court when the court was hearing the case. The argument that the court that the, the Affordable Care Act could be justified under Congress's taxing power, not the not the Commerce Clause. And he upheld the law. Well, sorry. But why? Why did he do it? Okay, well you take it as face value. But I don't think that's that's enough. You know, this case was um, the third, really, in a, in a trilogy of cases. Bush v. Gore in 2000, Citizens United in 2010, the Obamacare case in 2012. In each of these cases, the court was dealing with the most politically charged issues, and the five Republicans were arrayed against the four liberals. Roberts sees himself, quite properly, I think, as the embodiment of the court's public reputation. He's responsible for what people think of the court. And he knew that if, for a third time, the five Republicans were to vote against the four Democrats in a politically charged case like this, undoing an achievement the Democratic presidents have been trying to do for three generations, he knew that this court would have been discredited and that it would have been a big issue in the political campaign of 2012. And it wasn't, as you all so I mean, really was hardly talked about at all. It didn't come up in the presidential debates at all. Um, and Roberts did not want that. He did not want the court to be a political football, so he knew it was best to retreat. He knew, too, that the idea of an individual mandate, a requirement that individuals buy health insurance, it was a Republican idea. It was an idea that came out of the Heritage Foundation. Uh, Newt Gingrich was a supporter of it for a long time. A guy named Mitt Romney, who you may remember was former governor of Massachusetts, he was for it for, for a long time. But you know, only when Barack Obama proposed it did it become constitutionally controversial. Another reason why it looked like such a political attempt to use the court to undo a democratic achievement. And Roberts said no. But let me assure you, that last June 25th, the day this case was decided, John Roberts did not suddenly discover his inner model. <laughs> he remains deeply conservative. And we look ahead to cases that they're deciding this year, the future of affirmative action, the future of the Voting Rights Act, same-sex marriage. Um, I don't think there's any doubt you will see John Roberts siding uh, with the most conservative members of the court, but we'll see. And I look forward to watching with you. And with that, I look forward to taking your questions. Yeah. Um, we'll take questions. And because we're recording this, I ask that you um, speak your questions into the microphone. So um, any questions? Who has some questions? Thank you so much. This was really great. Um, you mentioned that one of the big stories from last Tuesday was the same-sex marriage cases, but another big story, I think, was the marijuana legalization uh, referenda and the uh, the California uh, issue of uh, changing the three strikes law. And it seems like there's kind of maybe it's wishful thinking, but a shift in thinking about the war on drugs and mass incarceration. Um, I wonder what, if any, role might the court play in moving the country towards addressing those issues? Well, you know, I, I, think, um, I think you're onto something. I think there is ferment on these issues. You know, in, in the classic American way, um, it is often most persuasive when put in an economic context rather than a moral context. I mean, you know, the, the, the issue of 
you know, how expensive is it to prosecute and incarcerate people for marijuana? How expensive is it to put nonviolent offenders in prison for three strikes and you're out? And I would add to that the death penalty, which was also almost overturned uh, by uh, the California voters as well. Um, support for the death penalty has gone down a lot in, in recent years, in part because I think people recognize that um, contrary to popular belief, putting people in prison for life actually costs a great deal less than the enormous amount of litigation that goes on around uh, death penalty cases. Um, so yes, I do think um, that it is indicative of ferment on these issues, largely on economic grounds. You know, this is an area where, um, these are areas where the court sees itself, I think appropriately, better following rather than leading. Um, the court is rarely a leader in social change. And um, you, you, you saw it on a, a abortion. I think many people, even some liberals, felt that the court was too soon to decide Roe v. Wade because the political process was moving in that direction. Um, I, I think, you know, when it comes to marijuana in particular, I think that's what you were asking about. I mean, it is really purely a political matter because now you have states that have decriminalized, like Colorado. But it is still a crime under federal law. And Barack Obama, as far as I can tell, is not going to expend a single bit of his political capital saying, you know, I think people should be allowed to smoke pot. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, so, so it's going to have, so the federal government is going to have to be, you know, change its laws. But I, I think that the, the movement is in that direction. Um, and, but, but I think it's going to have to come from the political branches of government and the voters, not from the Supreme Court. I know you are being taped, just like on CNN. <laughs> but but what, how do you see or how do you project who may leave coming up and who, what changes you may see? Well, one of the good things about working in, in cable television, as, as you may have noticed, is there is absolutely no sanction for being wrong. <laughs> uh, and and uh, the, the, the most important three words you are never allowed to say on cable news are, I don't know. You always have to have an answer, even if it's preposterous and absurd, as many of them often are. Um, and, and, and so I am unchastened by my fantastically incorrect prediction on the healthcare case. Um, there are four justices in their 70s. Uh, Ruth Ginsburg is 79, Justice Scalia and Justice Kennedy are 76, and Justice Breyer is uh, 74. Uh, I think it is close to a certainty that Justice Ginsburg will, will leave in the next four years. Um, she said, uh, has said on various occasions that she wants to leave when um, she's 82, which is what Louis Brandeis was, and Brandeis was her hero. Um, the, um, um, if, if Romney had went one, I think she would have said, well, you know, 84. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, so I think she would leave. Uh, by the same token, I think Scalia and Kennedy will not leave if they can, uh, if they can avoid it. Um, and, and Breyer, I'm less certain about. You know, I mean, it's, it's a little ghoulish, but you know, when you're dealing with Supreme Court justices, what is a social pleasantry is actually a very freighted question. How are you? <laughs> no, I'm, no, no, I, I want to know, how are you? And I'd like to, I'd like to see the blood work, too. Uh, so, I mean, you know, they, they're getting old. Uh, but, you know, they're not. John Stevens served till he was 90. Uh, so I think Ginsburg will definitely leave. The others, uh, it's more of a mystery. Uh, the gentleman in the back from the blue Um, You mentioned Breyer's quote about I'm doing so much, I'm so new. Uh, to me, that sort of speaks to Morrison and Lopez. I was wondering when the court eventually shifts back, if you think we'll return more to a Wickard um, jurisprudence on the Commerce Clause, and is that more liberals are willing to go so far uh, on the ACA decision indicative of that? 
I offer a simultaneous translation? Of the <laughs> I mean, I, I, there, there was a lot. There, there was a, there was a lot there that uh, that, that I think you know o- only specialists will, will understand. Um, I, let me just, just go back to the New Deal. I mean. It, it, Believe me, this answer will not be that long. Um, <laughs> in, in the New Deal, you know, the first term of Franklin Roosevelt, the Supreme Court um, struck down a whole bunch of uh, the uh, initiatives that Roosevelt uh, put, for, put forward in National Recovery Administration, Agricultural Adjustment Act, and um, Roosevelt responded with the court packing plan which was, you know, embarrassing and a disaster and didn't really, and, and, but, you know, he, he outlasted the Supreme Court. He wound up appointing eight justices. And the eight justices, they disagreed on many things, but the one thing they all agreed on was the federal government had the power to regulate the national economy. And a decision this gentleman made a reference to, Wickard v. Philbin, was sort of the, the, the crowning achievement of this view, which basically said, Anything that remotely had anything to do with the regulating the federal, um, um, regulating the national economy, Congress could regulate. If Congress thought it affected the national economy, even if it was people not acting or acting, um, that distinction was meaningless. Congress could regulate it. And um, there were two decisions in the 90s, Morrison and Lopez, which sort of questioned that. But the heart of the attack on the Affordable Care Act was an attack on this idea of a broad Commerce Clause power, sort of a pre-New Deal idea of the Constitution. And, and, and what this gentleman asked is, you know, if the liberals sort of got five votes, would they reestablish the Commerce Clause as essentially a blank check to Congress? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, I, I do think this is something, I mean, this, this is a bedrock principle of democratic constitutionalism capital D, which is that the federal government has the power, the democratically elected branches of government have the power to pass laws that affect the national economy, and it's up to Congress, not the court, to discern, to determine that. But what we saw in the Affordable Care Act decision is it looks like there are five votes now for a more restrictive view. Now, whether that applies to other cases remains to be seen. I have my doubts, but that is a, that is a key issue with the court going forward. Hi, we've just looked through a pretty scary time about um, uh, male politicians talking about female biology and abortion. And um, I was just wondering whether you think the only way that we can overturn our lives what you You know, the Republican Party is having a hard time <laughs> when, when <laughs> someone says, well, you know, like, the rape candidate lost, and you have to say which rape candidate. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it's a big, uh, it was a big problem. So, like, rape is not usually a, like, a very political issue. Uh, but, I mean, it just shows how far. I mean, you know, this is the problem that the Republican Party faces, that people like that, you know, Tea Party acolytes, they can get the nomination for statewide office in a lot of places. I mean, you know, the Republicans might well control the United States Senate if they didn't nominate all these knuckleheads like, you know, Murdoch in Indiana and, and Aiken in Missouri and the, the witch in Delaware two years ago. I mean, it, you know, it, it, it's Sharon Angle in Nevada. I mean, they keep nominating these really extreme candidates. Um, about Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade is absolutely secure until January 20th, 2017. Uh, because Barack Obama, there are five, the four liberals obviously are not going to vote to overturn Roe v. Wade, and Anthony Kennedy was one of the co-authors of the Casey decision in 1992. He is not going to change his mind. He is not going to suddenly vote to overturn Roe v. Wade. He's on record supporting at least the core of Roe. So, you know, for the next four years, Roe is safe. But, I mean, you know, as always, if you want to know about the future of the Supreme Court, you only need to answer one question. Who's, who's winning the presidential elections? You know, if after Barack Obama, you know, Paul Ryan serves two terms, and then Ted Cruz serves two terms, and then, uh, you know, Todd Aiken serves two terms, we're going to have one kind of Supreme Court. But if after Barack Obama, 
Hillary Clinton serves two terms, and Andrew Cuomo serves two terms, and by then Malia Obama serves two terms, <laughs> you know, then we're going to have a very different Supreme Court. So, you know, if, um, the, I think she might be 35 by then. I haven't done the math, but it, she'll be in the ballpark. Um, the, um, but, but it's safe for four years, there's no question about it. I'd like to um, ask about the Supreme Court following as opposed to leading. There have been times when the Supreme Court did stick its neck out and lead, and people yelled and screamed, but they followed, such as the uh, Brown versus Board of Education decision. As a matter of fact, I think uh, some of the members of the Supreme Court led others and tried to get them to be unanimous. Um, so I'm wondering, do you think that we can return to a time when the Supreme Court is respected enough so that it can ever lead when it feels that the Constitution requires it? Well, I mean, you know, I, I, that, that, that's a very hard question. I, I, you know, a lot of people, I mean, I, you know, the Supreme Court led on the issue of campaign finance. You know, Citizens United is a decision that transformed American politics um, in 2010. And, you know, there are a lot of people who support that decision. You know. They're called Republicans, and and, and that and, and, and I'm not speaking facetiously. I mean, you know, these these are highly partisan issues, and they are not. Um, and and um, so, you know, I, I you know, the, the status of the Supreme Court as a leader is really in the eye of the beholders of of how you view the court. Now, you know, um, if tomorrow they were to say all 50 states. Had uh, were required to off, uh, allow same-sex marriages in their state, that would be a kind of leadership. I suspect in this room, a lot of people would support that idea. But you know, I think that would a lot of people outside this room would. And, and, and I think one one of the uh, tensions that's always present in the Supreme Court is how much uh, they are willing to get out of step with where the public feels on an issue. I mean, this was one of, I thought, Justice O'Connor's rare genius acts of, you know, is that she had this radar for where the public was. And she was also a true moderate in the sense that when she got controversial decisions, she would really try to get one side 51% and the other 49%, so that nobody was too unhappy. I mean, she was a politician in the best sense of the word. The current Republicans on the court are not politicians in that way. It's, they're more of an all or nothing court, and you know you get decisions like Citizens United as a result. Could you explain to us how much um, collaboration Obama would need from Republicans if he were to propose a new justice? Does he have the majority? Could it be a filibuster? How does that work? Well, that's 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 a that's a, that's a hard question to answer uh, in the abstract. I mean, go for the next two years, there'll be 55 Democrats and 45 Republicans. You know, you need 60 votes to break off a filibuster. The way the Senate works is the filibuster is not. They don't really filibuster most issues. They just say we are going to filibuster, and the Senate then moves on to other business. The, set, the, the um, a Supreme Court nomination is different. It is a sufficiently high profile act that Harry Reid, the, the majority leader, would actually make the Republicans filibuster, would make them talk all night. And I think sooner rather than later, um, they'd start to look pretty ridiculous holding up the country over a Supreme Court nomination as long as that nominee, nominee is, seen at, is broadly seen as qualified. So, you know, most Supreme Court nominees get confirmed, particularly when the president's party is in control of the Senate, as will be the case at least for the next two years. It also depends on who leaves. If Ginsburg leaves, I think everyone recognizes that, that the ideological balance on the court is not going to change much no matter who Obama produce, uh, nominates. And I think there will be much, much more of a willingness, even on the part of Republicans, to say, hey, you know, 
it just doesn't make that much of a difference. It'll be a younger person, but it'll be someone who votes the same way. If for some reason Obama gets to uh, nominate a replacement for one of the conservative justices, say hello to World War III. I mean, yeah. it, it's, it would be, then you might get a filibuster, then you could see the Senate paralyzed for weeks. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think all those factors are, are in play. Okay, we have time for one more question, and then we'll ask you all to rejoin us in the library for refreshments and uh, the book signing. So, last question. Well, we, we've seen a can, lot can of laws that have been, uh, they've tried to pass this year uh, that would restrict voter rights, and then there's this court case coming up where a county in the South wants to challenge a part of the Voter Rights Act. How do you see that playing out in light of what's happened recently? Well, you know, this, this is one of the very big cases that they're going to be hearing this year. You know, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 uh, had a famous provision called Section 5. And Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act said that for counties that had histories of discriminating against African Americans, uh, and they were mostly in the South, I mean, basically the whole South, any time they wanted to change anything about anything relating to voting, location of polling places, voting districts, um, reapportionment, they had to go to Washington first. The Justice Department had to pre-clear, that's the term they used. And um, this, the Voting Rights Act has been reauthorized many times since 1965. It's been expanded, now covers Hispanics as well as African Americans. And, um, but many southern states and southern communities have been angry and frustrated that they are stigmatized by this law, that um, they um, are uh, singled out for special treatment when, as they say, um, you know, the world is very different in 2012 than it was in 1965. Paradoxically, one of, one of the best arguments <laughs> against the Voting Rights Act is that so much of this voter suppression laws took place in states that are not covered by the Voting Rights Act. Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, all these states that got new Republican majorities in 2010, they passed these voter suppression laws and they're not covered by the Voting Rights Act. So why, so, so that's, that, that's an argument they're using um, to say, look, it's just, it's not about uh, regions of the country anymore. Um, I think Chief Justice Roberts, you know, is going to again prove his conservative bona fides, and I do think um, he's going to strike down, you know, with the conservatives to vote to strike down the law. But you know my record on these. <laughs> so anyway, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Very much.